Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year, we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. Since the March 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country, the Reagan Foundation is now bringing its events online to ensure that we are still delivering world-class content, even if you can't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. In this week's Center for Public Affairs virtual event, we bring you American speechwriter Mark Salter for his brand new book, The Luckiest Man, Life with John McCain. Governor and Mrs. Reagan first came to know John McCain as a returning prisoner of war, whose POW bracelet they had worn. That bracelet has been on display in the Reagan Library since its opening in 1991. In the years after, he became a deeply respected and cherished personal friend. Senator McCain was an inspiring risk taker. Time and again, he demonstrated his willingness to sacrifice for his country and his beliefs. From his extraordinary courage in a Hanai dungeon to his practice of putting principle over political expediency, he consistently modeled character and conviction. Luckiest Man is a deeply personal and candid remembrance of the late Senator John McCain from one of his closest and most trusted confidants, friends, and political advisors, Mark Salter who worked with the Senator on several nonfiction books, as well as on political speeches, and who also served as his chief of staff. During today's conversation, Mark Salter discusses his new book, which covers all the major events of McCain's life, while also introducing aspects of the man that the public rarely saw and hardly knew. Woven throughout this narrative is also the story of Salter and McCain's close relationship, including how they met and why their friendship stood the test of time in a political world known for its fickle personalities and frail bonds. The capstone to Salter's intimate and decade-spanning time with the senator, the luckiest man is the authoritative last word on the stories of McCain was too modest to tell himself in an influential life not soon to be forgotten. We now invite you to enjoy our virtual program coming to you from our Air Force One Pavilion Leadership Academy Oval Office with Mark Salter and Reagan Foundation and Institute Executive Director John Highbush. Mark Salter, uh, let me just say as a fan of Senator McCain's over many years. It's just an honor to have you, um, author of this book and co-author of so many books for Senator McCain with us for uh, this virtual event at the Reagan Library. We'd love to have you come visit with us with the book in hand someday when this virus gets past us. But congratulations for really a, just a terrific book. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's an honor to be here and an honor to be virtually at the Reagan Library. I've been there physically a, a few times for a couple of presidential uh, uh, debates, but uh, it's a wonderful museum to a wonderful American. Yeah. Um, thanks, Mark. Um, let's, from the very beginning, um, talk about how did you, I know you cover this in the book, but it, it's a neat story. How did you meet Senator McCain? When was that and what were the circumstances? Well, it's the story I tell every college kid who asked me what my career plan was. And uh, I had uh, uh, graduated from Georgetown in the 1981. And uh, all my friends were going to New York, all my college buddies were going to New York to work on Wall Street and make money. But I was a, a political science and government major. And, um, and uh, my only connection was I knew the new ambassador to the UN, Ronald Reagan's ambassador, Jean Kirkpatrick, Georgetown professor, who had brought a lot of Georgetown people with her. And I got a sort of an entry level job in the press office in New York. And uh, oh, after a while, um, you know, of clipping newspapers and transcribing uh, Security Council debates, um, the press council had me write a speech for her. And then I became, I always caveat this by saying I was a speech writer for Jean Kirkpatrick. But if a paragraph ever survived of my draft and her final draft, it was a, a glorious day. <laughs> <laughs> Understood. It's just, it's, it's, she looked at them as just mere suggestions <laughs> and none of them yeah. very good. But anyway, she kept me around for a while. And I also sort of sidelined as her press officer. And uh, she was giving a speech at George H.W.'s no uh, nominating convention in New Orleans in 1988. And I, I accompanied her. And um, 
had worked on a draft of the speech and she had agreed to do a bunch of press interviews after the speech and uh, we um, we were at the last one and I couldn't find it. It's, it's super dome, huge cavernous place and not really my fault. I couldn't find it. I called the press shop and they sent up a volunteer to take us to it. And it turned out to be John McCain's press secretary at the time, Tori Clark. We sort of hit it off. And when you know I got Kirkpatrick back to the hotel, we went out to get a beer and uh, she introduced me to a bunch of McCain people. We bumped into on Bourbon Street, and, <clears throat> and then they invited me to uh, listen to Bush's acceptance speech from the Arizona delegation the next night. Uh, so I did, where Tori introduced me to John McCain, who said something like, Tori says you're a good writer. Maybe you can write something for me someday. And uh, we had like 20-second exchange, and uh, uh, that actually became a, a, an offer to write a couple of speeches for him, which worked out, you know, while I was still working for Gene Kirkpatrick. And uh, he called me into, I thought, discuss another speech he wanted me to do and uh, offered me his foreign aids, foreign affairs aides job, who was leaving to go work in Bush's State Department. And uh, I took it. Um, I ended up marrying one of the staffers I met on Bourbon Street <laughs> that <laughs> night. And uh, so it was quite a monumental, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, incompetence on my part that, you know, led, so people asked me for what you, my, my grand plan was. I said, I plan to get lost in the Superdome and let, let the rest of my life happen. <laughs> you know, a great story. Um, so, and, and you mentioned Jean Kirkpatrick and writing for her. Um, I would bet that the creative process of writing for Jean Kirkpatrick might have been a little different than it was with John McCain. Tell me about the creative process between you and the senator for, I think, with those seven books. Yeah. yeah um, well, it's, uh, you know, the books are, there are two, two varieties. They're memoir-ish. You know, three of them are. Uh, one, one of those three is sort of a hybrid memoir and then biographies of people he admired. And then the other three uh, were just people he admired. So they're a little different. Uh, for those that weren't about him, it was mostly we agreed on who to write about. The, you know, he, he, the people he wanted to write about, he told me what it was he wanted me to emphasize about them, you know, and uh, then I would be free to go ahead and write it. And per his approval, he, you know, check the draft. And uh, the memoir was more of a very journalistic. It was just sit down and, you know, Q and A for, you know, at the end of the day, we, you know, we, we kept, you know, 12 hour, 14 hour day, not unusual in the Senate, you know, and we often ate in the office. And so we'd, we'd get a pizza or something and, and uh, I'd ask him a million questions he'd answer and he'd work on, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd sort of collaborate on the shape and direction of the book. But he it was really just, you know, and, and you know, getting him when he, he was in an expansive mood. So he might, you know, be a little more uh, talkative about things he normally wasn't. Yeah. Well, was he a tough grader in the sense of, uh, you know, uh, an editor that really goes at every line or, no, or did you no. read to Jake Patrick? Patrick most certainly was. He, he was not. We, we had a very similar, he's, I don't know if people appreciate just how, how widely read he was. He was a very deeply read person, fiction and nonfiction. And he had strong views on, you know, writing styles. And, uh, um, uh, and so he, he, we we sort of shared a similar taste in literature. Um, not not he he loved Hemingway. I wasn't an immense Hemingway fan, but uh, but other than that, we love Irish writers. And uh, he uh, um, you know so you know he's you know you sort of you imitate or you know you can't help but impersonate the kind of things you like to read. And I think that. We both had an affinity for a same kind of style of writing that that he never we know he I never had very I mean there were things he said you know I don't know if I want to talk about that in that detail that's not what I really meant when I told you that that sort of thing but it wasn't like you know you got too many adjectives in that line boy take them out you know not yeah that. sure 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 well but before this interview's over I might see if I can convince you to be more of a Hemingway fan but we'll we'll, we'll, we'll get to <laughs> I'm that. not a, I, I'm not, I'm not averse to him. I mean I, I become yeah. uh, you know, I, 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 I'm not, I hesitate to say worked on. I was involved in screening and sending up a McCain interview for Ken Burns film that's coming out in April on Hemingway, a, a three part series, you know, and it, it you know, it, uh, he, he, he wasn't, wasn't a very good person, but he, he was a pretty original stylist. And, uh, you know, I give him, I give him points for that for sure. Tell me, where did the, title the luckiest man come from i i 
Obviously, if you know your history, especially baseball history, everyone remembers the Lou Gehrig speech. But from a McCain standpoint, where did it come from? Well, when he was um, diagnosed with a glioblastoma in the last year of his life, he repeated it almost incessantly. I'm the luckiest man. Don't Nobody cheated me. I've had a great ride. I'm the luckiest man you'll ever meet. Look at me. And he had this thing he chanted almost like a mantra, you know, fifth from the bottom of my class, the Naval Academy and the Republican nominee for president, you know, unbelievable. And they really thought, what a ride he had had. And, uh, and he felt that way, not, not only because he'd had a lot of, had a very big, rich, adventurous life. There's no, very few people I've met who's led a life quite like his. And, uh, um, yeah, he had several very close brushes with death that he survived. You know, he crashed a few airplanes. He was shot down once. The forest all fire. It was a, uh, but what he really meant from it that he that he was able to by sort of showing, having courage and sacrificing in service to others to a cause bigger than himself, as he would always say. Um, you know, it, he felt it sort of redeemed him from the, his you know whatever flaws and mistakes he had, he, which he would. <laughs> usually own up to, but he felt redeemed from those. And he thought that was very important. That's how you get around the deficiencies of your own character is by really sacrificing and showing courage for others. And, uh, and that's what he thinks, you know, as I said, he made his own luck and that's how, that's how he made it. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't cost free. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, I want to explore that for a minute. Uh, the point that you made about, you know, fifth from the bottom of his class at, at the Naval Academy, because it's almost if you've ever brushed up against uh, John McCain, everyone seems to know that. And, 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 uh, and, and so it's part of the folklore of John McCain um, that I wonder if there's a connection between that important fact and story and his reputation as a maverick. And I I say that because, you know, the story of John McCain is, okay, he was a troublemaker, quote unquote, in, uh, at the Naval Academy, and, and that kind of represented why he was a supposed troublemaker within the Republican Party or in politics. Is there a connection there, and does that make that Naval Academy story important? Yeah, he, he liked to assert his own autonomy, and I think the, the, the sort of narrative arc of his story is come to terms with... Uh, you know, he felt that the Naval Academy had been forced on him. He probably would have gone there, he said, you know, uh, but it, he, he was always introduced by his parents to friends as, this is Johnny, he's going to the Naval Academy someday. And, uh, um, he, you know, he said he wants somebody, he, he had, he, he, as I said, he, was, he, he loved to read. And he said, I wanted to major, I wanted to go to Princeton and major in English literature. And uh, which people laugh at you. So when I tell them, but he, he really meant it. And, uh, um, he did, you know, he, he did like to assert his autonomy and he didn't, he had a very, uh, um, he had a, um, very finely tuned BS detector and never more finely tuned than what is, than when he was the, 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 the author of that BS. And he just thought that, you know, you didn't have to, you could have rough edges, you could be a character and stuff, but as long as, what you did wasn't for yourself alone. Um, that you were, he, you know, in his case, his country. Um, um, that you, you know, that you, that you expended most of your energy, took most of your chances uh, for the country or for some cause greater than yourself. Then you know, you could be okay. And that's sort of the lesson I think he learned in prison. You know, when it, when when the Vietnamese did, they eventually beat him up badly enough to force him to make up. A fake confession, and uh, he realized, you know, he wasn't as, you know, that, you know, he could, you know, no matter how tough you were, you could meet a force tougher than you. So, you know, like it's, it's, uh, you know, that's fate, and uh, um, and that the way he got through it was, the, you know, other POWs, you know, especially the guy in the cell next door to him, Bob Craner, talking him back up, you know, and getting him back on his feet. But um, um, so, yeah, there was a. You know, it's funny you mentioned fifth and about because Trump, for some reason, when his when whenever he felt like taking a shot at John, was always he'd graduated last in the class, and, and when McCain was still alive and heard that, no fifth. <laughs> <laughs> I want to clarify that, right? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's interesting. Uh, but you know that label, the label, John McCain, the Maverick. Um, my sense is, I don't want to say it, he didn't it, like the term, but I don't. That's not how he defined himself, was it? No, he would use it sometimes. You know, I mean, he would. Yeah, you know, I'm a Maverick, and he would get it sometimes. But no, he he felt uh, uh, he 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 was a leader, and you can't really be him. And you know, the guy that really wrote most the most. Uh, 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 deeply and I think persuasively about McCain at the Naval Academy was Bob Timber, the late journalist, the Baltimore Sun journalist, who wrote a wonderful book called The Nightingale Song, which is about five five guys that went on to prominent government careers who had all gone to the Naval Academy. And, uh, you know, it was you know, Jim Webb and John Poindexter and uh, Bud McFarlane and uh, Al- Oliver North and, uh, and McCain. And he... Uh, um, he said McCain was he, McCain's best friend at the Naval Academy was Chuck Larson, who went on to have a very illustrious naval career. He was commander in chief of U.S. forces in the Pacific, sink back, and was twice the superintendent of the Naval Academy. He was as a very young officer was Richard Nixon's Na- Navy aide, and uh, um, and he was, I think, you know, the president of his class, or you know, uh, you know, command, brigade commander, whatever, whatever. <laughs> I forget what 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 office he had um, at the Naval Academy. And McCain was, you know, fifth in the bottom, and always this close to, you know, bilging out because he had too many demerits. And just they just as but they he, they he they said they were both they were they they were friends because they were both leaders. McCain was this idiosyncratic, you know, instinctive. You know, but, you know, when McCain said it was time to go over the wall, people went over the wall with him, you know, and uh, and that's that was the nature of his appeal. And you can't be just idiosyncratic and be that you have to be able to connect and lead and be part of a a, a cohort of some kind. You know, uh, um, you have to be good at that or you you no, nobody follows you. Yeah, sure. If this is a tough one, but OK, not Maverick, but if you as um his author, uh, what single word, if you were forced to, would you use to define John McCain? Wow, well, what a good question. I, I, I may, um, my, my, you want to think about that? My, well, my, my instinct says guts, he had guts. Um, he just had more than his fair share of guts. And I think- Courageous, perhaps. I think, and, and I, yeah, and I used to think, you know, that was the most important virtue but I don't anymore now that I've gotten to enter my old age. And uh, um, I think it's humility. And I think it's humility that makes all the other virtues possible. And McCain had an, a really larger share of that virtue than a lot of people in this profession have. He really, he really, and I don't mean, by that, I don't mean modesty particu- particularly. I'm, I mean, uh, recognizing that you have as much dignity as any other person on earth, but not one bit more. And, you know, and that letting that motivate you, knowing that everyone has de- dignity equal to your own, that I think is the, the uh, you know, he had that, it, pe- what happened to people mattered to him. He was involved in mankind, as the poet wrote, you know. Um, it was, uh, his hero was a Hemingway protagonist, Robert Jordan, and the book was taken from that title, was taken from that poem, For Whom the Bell Tolls, and those things mattered to him, and he did. He cared, he, he cared deeply about people who were oppressed, and uh, so that's, I, I think, you know, in my own estimation of what, what the premier virtue is, has changed over time. I think if you'd asked me five years ago or 10 years ago what, what was the most important McCain quality, I would say is courage, but uh, humility, uh, humility I've come to realize was really, really his chief virtue. Sure. Well said. Um, a, a comment, not a question, but, uh, you know, for those that the millions of, of people that around the world that he impressed uh, through his service to the nation and duty of his life, it seems, um, the the last days of John McCain, the last few months, you know, when he was terribly ill. Um, so many of his fans, and me included, um, certainly wished him well, but also didn't know 
um, what was happening behind the scenes and how he was faring through all of this. Of course, that's a private family thing, but I, I, I just want to say, so your book was the first time that I'd ever gotten some insight uh, to how he carried himself and what was so important to him um, uh, during his lifetime. So I, mean, I just want to say it was, I just think of it was a great service on your part to find the right way to reveal that. And I, really well done. I appreciate that. It was a, you know, it was a rough year, but uh, unsurprisingly, he was he handled it. He was, you know, you know, pretty resilient guy. And I mean, it's an, it's an, a, a dreadful, dreadful disease. Um, and the, and the, the treatment for it is you know, dreadful and uh, um, debilitating. And uh, but you know, he 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 hung in there till almost the very end you know i mean insisting on some some measure of autonomy some you know some you know be in, engaged in his office and you know staff meetings on the phone and uh you know and uh you know it got down he became a over the course of the last 20 years he he became quite quite a kind of a burger you know he's he, they will mccain's have this lovely property in northern arizona about mid midpoint between Sedona and Cottonwood. It's in a little valley and there's a creek, a really beautiful creek, Oak Creek. The property's on a horseshoe bend of that and it attracts all kinds of birds, including a fairly rare species of black hawk. And uh, um, yeah, he would, um, uh, he, near the end, he would find him you know, spending most of the time looking at the birds. And uh, um, it was uh, where he, he had, had developed quite an affinity for. Yeah. Um, in, in fact, I want to touch on that in just a minute. I had the great opportunity to visit that ranch at, um, uh, several years ago, and I can so much see why it was a, a place for him to kind of collect who he was all about and, and life itself. Um, so having written seven books with him in this this. Uh, when my, it might well be your last book on John McCain. How, how has his death affected you, uh, having been so close to him throughout your life? Um, you know, like a, like any you know, close friend or family member's death would. Uh, you, he took he took up an enormous space in people's lives. He was just uh, so uh, exhilarating to be around, and um, um, so there's a a, a certain dullness <laughs> to life you know uh, you know the, you know he, he he was irreplaceable you know and i'm not that my I, I live a very comfortable life and i have a nice home on the coast of maine and um great f families in good health and everybody's happy and uh, it's good but it's not it, life isn't as exciting as it once was and that's largely attributable to his absence i think um you know, it, it, he, and, you know, and he took up a lot of, of my time, you know, um, you know, it's, uh, um, you know, which is, you know, no, I'm, I'm rather I more idle than I <laughs> probably should be, but, but um, the, 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 I guess most importantly, uh, I could have used, you know, he was um, in that first year, you know, I, I, I'm not a big fan of the outgoing president and, uh, you know, worried about what he was doing to our alliances and uh, our reputation overseas and, you know, sort of the, um, you know, sort of Western liberalism. And um, um, McCain in that, uh, you know, in the first months of Trump's presidency was just very, you know, I mean, he was critical of Trump uh, fairly regularly, but, you know, he sort of steadied everybody around him. Here's how we'll, you know, he spent a lot of time traveling around the world before he was diagnosed, reassuring allies that this was a temporary phenomenon, you know, that don't, don't give up on America, you know, and uh, I, you know, that sort of encouragement, you know, we could have used the last three years. Um, I think I could have used personally, you know, kept me from acting too goofy on Twitter or something, but uh um, so yeah, you know, in a lot of, you know, I sort of, you know, you're used to it now. It's been two years and over two years and, uh, but, you know, I talked to him almost every day of my life for 30 years, you know, it's a strange, strange thing when, when that 
that, that big a presence in your life is gone. Yeah, it leaves a real hard, void. I'm hard sure. to get used to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what have you been doing since he passed away? I mean, obviously you were a writer, you were a yeah. foreign affairs specialist. What What's occupying your life now? Uh, I'm writing, you know, I've worked on this book for quite a while. Um, it's the biggest book I've ever, I don't want to scare away any readers, but, you know, I wanted to, I wanted it to be, um, um, you know, I wanted to do him justice in a style that he would appreciate, which was not affected and not uh, not uh, too ornate or not puffing up his virtues and, and hiding his flaws, you know, um, he would want me to be candid and straightforward about it. And, you know, it's, it's a kind of a tricky thing to do when you're writing about somebody you admire, you know, and, uh, um, but um, so, you know, I spent the last, you know, better part of the, the two years he's been gone working on this book. I also have clients I write for and uh, I was I was perfectly ideally situated for a COVID pandemic you know, since I can <laughs> work work from anywhere and uh, and and was doing that anyway and in Maine where they've been social distancing for centuries up here you know it's, <laughs> it's like a nature to everybody. Yeah yeah well put well put. Um, you know, having had the chance to work um, in the Senate as a staff member um, myself, uh, and having, you know, uh, you know, truth be told, having supported the Senator McCain's presidential campaign and a lot of the things he's done, um, but never having the chance to serve on his staff or closely with him, I got the sense that, um, and I don't want to make this comparison. Uh, at all directly, but you know, if you were a person, a staffer that worked for John Kennedy, over uh, so at some point in your life, um, in, you know, very uh, different political persuasion. But you know, you know a Kennedy staffer and how they speak and how they feel about life just by knowing that they worked for him. And I always got the same impression. Obviously, philosophically different, but those that worked closely with John McCain, it was a family was my sense. And so describe that. What's, what makes a person a McCain staff person? Well, you're, you're, you're right to say that, because I think maybe it worked for him for a long time. You know, it was a sort of a scene grade to him. With that, you, they looked at that. I, I stopped working in the Senate uh, when I went over to the presidential campaign in 2007, but I was there 18 years. And I still view it as like this seminal, you know, professional event of my life, you know, the, the, the defining event. Yeah. I, I was a McCain staffer. That's right. and if you if you ask me if I lived another hundred years and did a bunch of other things, if you ask me what what I'm a McCain guy. Um, yeah. it, it was you're you're right about that. And uh, I you know I, I, he was such a it, like I said it was exhilarating to work around him. And he was involved in a million things all the times. Was he was the most restless person you'd ever meet, and just the most curious. You know, his restless curiosity just drove him into all sorts. So you, you'd have you'd be juggling all sorts of balls at the same time, but involved in all sorts of interesting stuff, you know. And he was a guy who was, you know, he had a real, he was kind of, I, I said he had dualities to his nature. And the, sort of the defining one was he was a quite a cynic about the world, but he was very romantic about his causes, you know. And, uh, um, you know, uh, which was just a, a, that's a curious mix, you know. And it, you, you find yourself in all sorts of, you know, fantastically interesting situations because of it. And uh, um, you just knew you were working for somebody not just larger than life. It's hard to say, but somebody whose style of life was had you know, few, few peers, you know, few, few, uh, uh, you know, uh, people like him. And uh, you just, you, you hurtled through time with him, you know, and so I, as he hurtled through his life, you know, and it's just, you just knew that this period of your life, it was going to be, you're going to be more exhilarated, more involved, more, <clears throat> more amazed at things than you, you, you were in any other job you're going to do. And it, it leaves a lasting impression for, you, you know, and you really, it, it bonds you to the guy in, in ways that other jobs don't. Yeah, and uh, perhaps there's an element uh, I've always felt that character counts, meaning yeah. if you worked for John McCain, it said something about you as a person and your interest in having character. Yeah, it, it was, I, th I think it, it well, certainly, cer certainly he was a man of high character, um, not without his flaws. 
but high high character who was willing to put his life on the line for others, literally. Um, um, so yeah, you know, it's you, you knew it was going to be different than working for a lot of politicians. You know, I'm not I'm not a guy that's totally cynical about politics or anything. And you know, there are very many fine people in the profession. You know, but it's you know you you meet quite a few craven types too. You know, and it's it's uh, you know they're hard hard to hard to avoid. <laughs> but sure. uh, um, so you know he he stood out in comparison to most most people I know in many many ways, and not just most politicians I know. I I, did, I I knew no one else like him. Yeah, yeah. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, like any human, he was not without flaws. Um, I wonder, you know, if he were here today talking to us, uh, and you asked, you know, where could you stand the greatest improvement? Where, what flaw do you carry, Senator, uh, as you've gone through life that that could use work? Yeah. You know, he he knew he had a, a temper, and he did. He had a he had a quick temper. You know, could go like that, and 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 if it was in full flourish, it was impressive. Um, yeah. You know, and yep. you, you you tended to remember it. Uh, it. Generally, that temper was directed at colleagues and not at people who worked for him. You know, um, but you know, it would flare once, and he knew it, and he knew he had to work on it. He was impetuous. He knew he jumped into things. Just because he was curious and wanted and, and and loved to be in the center of of action and uh, in the arena, as he you know always said, quoting Teddy Teddy Roosevelt. And uh, but he, you know, could sometimes you know when you're impetuous, you know, you find yourself in quicksand. <laughs> you know, it's like whoops. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, you know, he 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 knew that too. He knew it's, it's funny when he. I've got a. We're both Irish, and um, I've got a bit of a temper too, and. Um, when he hired me, I was first hired to be his foreign affairs aide and and kind of chief writer in the office, and uh, and then he made me as what we called what chiefs of staff called ourselves back in those days, administrative assistants. You know, before we inflated the title to something grandiose. <laughs> but, um, um, he hired me to be his AA. Um, um, he told me. Uh, he goes, look, uh, just one thing. Uh, we both have tempers. I'm going to, you know, I wanted to be my A. We both have tempers. And then he kind of looked at me. One of us should do something about that. <laughs> which, was, which meant me. <laughs> so I, I, I tried to become the, the the guy who restrained his temper, you know, or could talk him, talk him down if he got angry with someone. And uh, I, I, I viewed that as a key part of my portfolio. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Well, I, having again been in the Senate uh, on the campaign side, I um, I was the object of Senator McCain's temper on a few occasions. So, I I know the territory of which you speak. So. <laughs> um, his, you know, a lot of his character. I, I don't know how any of his days of his life could have been any more difficult than his time as a prisoner of war. Uh, and and I wonder, you know, there's the silent generation, the the greatest generation that has often been written about from World War II, but he was of the Vietnam generation. And uh, can you tell me um, what characterized his storytelling uh, from you know the most difficult of his days? Was he reticent to talk about? The most personal of things that that he encountered as a prisoner, or no, he was fully forthcoming. Yeah, no, he was reticent. He was not a boomer. You know, one from the baby boom. He was born in 1936. He was five years old. He said the first sort of major event in his life, in his memory, was uh, when his there were, his father was a submarine skipper at the sub base in New London, Connecticut, and. Uh, and they were outside, so it was an unusually warm December morning, and we were outside, or um, and uh, um, I don't know if it was morning or afternoon, but it was an unusually warm December day. A black sedan pulled up in front of their house, and he was in the front yard, and some, some off, some you know, uh, uh, fellow officer of Jack McCain's, Admiral McCain, one day Admiral McCain, um, yelled out. Jack, the chaps are bomb Pearl Harbor. And his father said, my dad came out, got in the sedan, they drove to the base. And I don't remember seeing him again before. He, he did see him several times, but he says, in my mind, and he always likened that um, 
sedan. He, it was like a metaphor to him. He just said that it was like I looked at that sedan. I was five years old before I even understood what history was. You know, when I started to read history and understand history, I always looked at that black sedan like it was history coming to collect my dad. You know, and I think you know, I think you know he, he was aware of him, his, himself in history. He was aware of history's regard, you know, and and how that history would regard him, and it mattered to him. So you know, guys like that, uh, you know, they they say focused on their objectives. When 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 we did were working on the first book, which had the chief part of that book was about his time in prison. He was always just telling me, you know, he was always prefaced everything was I wasn't a some kid, I wasn't drafted, you know, at 18. I was 30, whatever he was, 31, 32 years old when I was shot down. I was a professional officer. I'd been trained. I was prepared for this as much as you can prepare for it, you know. And uh, you know, you know, I was determined to, to do, you know, do things sort of by the books, you know. And uh, um, so, you know, he would just want, he, he would, he was always telling me stories about like what he and Bob Craner in the cell next door were talking about or funny things that happened to them, you know, when they were, when all the prisoners were, you know, he was held in solitary. He said, those were the tough two, the first two years he was in solitary. He said, we're the worst. But eventually in the last couple of years, they were all in these big cells, like 25 guys to a cell in this big cell block they called um, Camp Unity. And they, they all took on various roles to keep each other entertained. McCain would, you know, sort of play out books he liked or movies he liked. He and Orson Swindle taught a class called the history of the world from the beginning, you know, and uh, other, you know, they, they, so you know, he would t always talk about that kind of stuff. But, you know, in terms of the torture, uh, other guys had it worse, you know. What were you thinking? You know, I had read somewhere that he had attempted suicide when he was on the verge of breaking and, and he just downplayed it right away. Just, you know, I just, he'd wrapped a shirt around his neck and put the sleeve through the, uh, the blind, the sort of French shutter type thing. Just a really not, not seriously. He said, I wasn't really trying to kill myself. I was trying to tell the Vietnamese, make the Vietnamese think I would kill myself. So they'd stop beating the crap out of me, you know? And, mm -hmm. uh, um, he just had a, and he would, you really had to sort of work on him to get details of that. Or like, wh how did they torture you? You know, how long did it last? You know, what were you thinking? You know, and he would tell, you know, and he had an eye, he had a writer's eye for, he told me a story about how uh, he, he liked things that were, that he knew would, would read well, you know, so he, he would, he would, like the guard who loosened his ropes when he's, so one of the chief tortures was they would bind guys arms behind them you know so their elbows were almost together and you know they'd be down like this and they'd leave them like there overnight and it was just you know horrifically hurtful and um he said one one night i was they left me in the ropes and the with what they called gun guards which was sort of the lowest in the the lowest order of guard in the camp they weren't even turnkeys they just sort of marched around the you know the prison with rifles over their shoulders and uh um he said uh this guy came in didn't say a word loosened my ropes walked out in the morning before his shift changed he came you know he came in and tightened them back up you know and then they, they let me out of the cell one Christmas morning, you know, and I was standing out in the courtyard for five minutes, as they let the prisoners do on Christmas, I guess. And uh, that same guard came over to him and stood next to him and drew a cross in the dirt, the sandal. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, so he he would t tell things he knew were, you know, had almost novelistic like that. He he would he would be forthcoming about. But in terms of his personal sort of stamina, courage, that kind of stuff, he you know you you had to you had to just keep at him. Yeah, yeah. I wonder, you know, I thought about uh, all of the uh, people who've become president of the United States and those who made the attempt at the office and, you know, some of the most uh, uh, important political figures of the last several decades. And if you think about the Vietnam generation, um, I got, you know, I, I couldn't bring another name to mind above John McCain that achieved as much success as he did. He was almost seems to me to be one of the most successful of people that came out of, that was part of the Vietnam generation. Can you think of anyone else who had that kind of stature who, you know, uh, yeah. 
No, not in politics. I mean, obviously, a lot of officers came out of Vietnam and went on to, you know, great careers and impressive careers. But uh, uh, I, I, I guess I can't think anybody in politics. Uh, there's never been a, well, Al Gore was vice president of the United States. He was a Vietnam veteran. Um, um, trying to think of anybody else. No, no, no Vietnam War veteran presidents, regrettably. We tried. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he was. He became. It really was about after I think the two thousand campaign when he really became a national politician. You know, and, and high name ID even before he, he won the nomination in two thousand and eight, and people started recognizing him. He was also um, one of those guys who just uh, he had an easy rapport with the public, and uh, I don't know if that had anything to do with Vietnam or not, or you know. He but he was just he never sweat small stuff. He never stood on ceremony. He stopped and talked to everybody who ever wanted to talk to him. When he went to a ballpark, he got applause. He didn't he didn't get booed, you know, because yeah. people because he because he went to a ballpark and he acted like a fan, you know. He's yeah. like you know he booing the refs, you know, when he got you know it's just yeah you know, and uh, talking to everybody that would talk to him, you know. It's uh, um, you know I, I I I'm sure there's there's some element of his personality that was you know uh, you know useful in Vietnam that was you know uh, you know uh, obviously appealing and in, in, in public as well, but um, I, I'm not sure which is it, other than his just he had an authenticity that just came through and he couldn't, he didn't take any, he made no effort to hide it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, kind of wrapped into that, Mark, um, if there's anything I noticed about uh, him when he would speak to large groups of people and maybe even small groups, but this um, interest in being self-effacing, you know, and, and, you know, telling jokes about himself and all that. And I wonder if that was his way of um, trying to ensure that, you know, while he might have been known as a real warrior and someone who was always on the attack for things he felt uh, were right and true, um, he also wanted to find a way that the common person could reach out to him. And, and, and in doing so, he decided to be self-effacing in the moment. Is, it, is, that, is that accurate? Yeah, I think that's quite accurate. He was, whenever there was a too uh, effusive a tribute to him by whoever was introducing him to speak, you know, if it if it centered on his, uh, the, this great American hero, you know, it's, he he would he was always aware of it and always, you know, and it it it, it, it always un, invariably the first thing he would say when he got to the mic was it doesn't take a lot of talent to get shot down. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, um, um, he was, uh, you know, he was. Uh, I think the jokes. I think that might have been a different matter. It may be a, a way to connect to say, "Hey, I'm you know, no better than any of you." But it goes back to the humility factor. Um, but uh, but it's also he was a frustrated stand-up comedian. I mean, <laughs> he, he was, you know, those jokes he stole them from everybody, including Bob Dole, Reagan. I'm sure he some, stole some from Reagan. Mo Udall, he stole a bunch of them from. You know, and, and I mean, you'd hear him decades. I mean, decades. And he would start every every public event with a 10 minute stand-up routine like a Henny Youngman type you know one-liners and, you know it's just I think he I think he was uh, yeah, I think he was he loved going on you know uh, you know comedian shows you know he loved doing you know the the, the late night stuff and uh, even guys that would get on like John Stewart he loved he loved doing them you know and uh, yeah he just he, he did Saturday Night Live and he'd get himself in trouble you know a, a bunch of times just trying to be a wise ass you know and yeah uh, yeah um, uh, and he had an excellent sense of timing, right? I mean, that's what you have to have in, in humor, right? Where did he pick up the uh, the phrase, my friends? You know, because <laughs> I don't you know. know. You, you reference it in the book, and I've oh, heard yeah. him say it 5,000 times, but oh, I, yeah. I just wonder what's the source of that? Yeah, it, I, I don't know. It was there when I met him. I don't know where it came from, uh, but it was in, every, you know, and it wasn't just in, in, in town halls or, or, or speeches or anything like that. It was, you know, he, when he, we have two or three people in the office talking, oh, those are my friends. You know, what I'm saying, dude, yeah. I, don't know, I don't know where it came from. I, I should have, I should have done a little research to try to figure that out. I'm, I'm not sure anyone knows where it came from, though. You know, it's just an affectation he's he's always he's always had um, that and uh, in his cynical nature, um, the. Uh, 
the, the line. A lot of people remember him saying that, you know, remember the words of Chairman Mao, it's always dark as four, it's totally black. <laughs> you know, and I can't tell you the number of people said, you know, I've re- I've Googled that and I never saw Mao saying that anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> he never, I don't think he did. I think he just said, why did he, why did he say it was from Chairman Mao? I said, I don't know. Ask him. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. You're right. I've, I've heard that one. Um, uh, why the special relationship between John McCain and the national media? I mean, and it's, it was something that uh, other politicians I no doubt envied, but it was also the same, very same national media that, I don't know if he felt this way, but to the observer, it looked like they turned on him uh, in the 2008 election. I, tell, talk to us about that. Um, well, I, I don't know if they turned on him, but they found somebody they, they liked better. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. um, but yeah. uh, um, um, and obviously, I'm painting with a broad brush here, which I shouldn't. Yeah. I mean, there, there are many journalists who take take that job seriously enough not to not to bend one way or another for any politician. But uh um, you know, I think one, he, he wasn't guarded around, he didn't he didn't view them as a threat, you know, he didn't like approach them like a you know, all bald a ball of nerves or something, you know. All right, here's some guys no smarter than I am, you know, is going to ask me a question. All right. You know, I can't answer a question. He just didn't, you know, he just didn't, he didn't, he didn't feel, in, he, he didn't feel intimidated by the press, even when they would come at him in huge gangs as they often would at, at you know, uh, big new news events, you know, um, and he kind of liked sparring back and forth with him. He'd be snippy with him, you know, uh, you know, I, when he, you know, in, 2000 and 2008 he's in the back of the bus he enjoyed it you know mm-hmm. i mean sparring back and forth once in a while you'd get somewhere he'd say something it'd cost you but uh or they you know ask him a question he really wasn't comfortable asking uh answering um but by and large he didn't mind it i think part of him sort of i think he sort of you know he he uh he talked about going to i mean it's just he's he he always was who 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 the public would get to know when when the forest all fired for those of you watching this uh he was his first assignment in vietnam was on the aircraft carrier of the uss forest all which had a terrible fire while he was there and it started when a missile from a plane across the deck flight deck from his plane struck you know mis- accidentally ignited and fired across the deck and struck his airplane and you know, 134 people, I think, died. It was terrible. And he, McCain had to roll through a fire, a wall of fire to get out of it. And, uh, um, um, you know, they, they, you know, they managed to put the fire out and the, the carrier limped in the Subic Bay in the Philippines and they flew out some pool reporters. And one of them was the famous New York Times correspondent or well-known New York Times correspondent, Johnny Apple, R.W. Mm-hmm. Johnny Apple. And that he and McCain began a lifelong friendship. You know, it's, he he like talked to McCain when they got to Subic and to come into Saigon with him because they don't didn't have a carrier. He wasn't going to fly any more missions till he got a new carrier. And so he went to the five o'clock follies, you know, the famous five o'clock follies in Saigon, you know, and watched the press pepper, you know, the military MACV spokesperson. And uh, and then I think he had drinks with them at the Continental. And, uh, you know, I said, hey, I thought, man, that, these guys got cool jobs. <laughs> you know, this, mm-hmm. this would be a fun way to make a living, you know. So I think yeah. he kind of, he kind of, you know, he, he, you know he, he was attracted to the profession. You know? Yeah. Let's spin the clock really uh, a long way forwards. Uh, in the book, you talk about what seems to have been a seminal moment in the latter uh, part of the senator's uh, political career. It's the reenlistment ceremony that he attended in, I think, 2007, right about the moment of him having uh, some, you know, real difficulty in the Republican primary. To talk to us about that ceremony and the impact that you write that it had on the senator. Yeah. Well, just to set it up, we he had he had announced for president in April, formally announced, but he'd been running. He was and and the press sort of regarded him as the front front runner at the very beginning of the cycle. Um, but he, you know, he, we you know, uh, so we built sort of a front runners campaign, which was you know sort of heavy with personnel, and we didn't really have the money to sustain it, and uh, we weren't we weren't fundraising at a 
you know, uh, you know, it's, uh, all that successfully at the time. And, uh, but we, anyway, in, in, in a lot of sort of factionalism in the campaign sort of cropped up and it was, he, he was unhappy with it. And I think he was on the verge of quitting, mm-hmm. getting out of the race. He just didn't feel, he had been skeptical about running again. Because 2000 was, he, we, we went, he went in as the underdog. He didn't expect to win. And he just, he just, he just went in there and did everything the way he would want to do it, you know, and uh, yeah. and it worked out well. He came out of it with an enhanced reputation, and uh, he he just wasn't feeling it the second time around for a while, and uh, um, and he kept asking us, can, you know, "Can we really bottle lightning twice?" And um, but anyway, the campaign was gonna, you know, was in trouble, and he had some decisions to make, and uh, he flew over there, and I think Lindsey Graham was with him, and he talking to Lindsay about it going over and t- telling Lindsay he thought he was, or Joe Lieberman too, maybe, or he thought he was going to get out, that it just wasn't, didn't feel like the right moment for him. And, uh, um, you know, he didn't feel like he was a strong advocate of the surge, the surge in Iraq. And he had advocated before, you know, uh, long before President Bush had, had, had decided to go that route and uh, really had advocated from like August of uh 2003 you know and uh um um and felt he, he was being forced in a situ- it was very unpopular the war was very unpopular at the time felt he was going to be forced into a situation where he couldn't be outspoken in defense of it as he wanted to be uh, but anyway he 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 flew flew to Iraq with with his friends and uh Petraeus took him around um showed him the progress that had been made during the surge in the early months of the surge and um, asked him to preside over a combination re-enlistment and naturalization service. So there were some soldiers who were about to become American citizens. They, were been, um, uh, uh, they had emigrated from Mexico. Um, and uh, um, he, uh, he, the most moving thing was there was a, a four chairs with four boots on from four of these guys who were to be naturalized, who were be made citizens, who had been killed the day before, you know, and Petraeus had a line uh, that just caused McCain to cry. He said something, you know, they they, um, they they gave their lives for their country before it was their country. And uh, so, so I think I'm, I, may, I may be paraphrasing it, but uh, and McCain just looked at these guys and they were, they, I mean, the beginning days of surge were, were pretty tough going and he, all these guys were signing back up, you know, and, you know, ready to do it. And he was just so touched, so moved by it and that he said, he told me afterwards, he says, if these guys can do it. If these guys can do it. I can do it, you know? And so he decided to stay in the campaign kind of shrunk down and Came very, uh, you know, bare, bare bones for a while, um, but we uh, we got through it. And he ended up being the nominee, but uh, but he was playing to very small crowds in New Hampshire, where he was campaigning almost exclusively on the surge, you know, and just saying this is why this is important. And I remember one event we did it was in somebody's garage in New Hampshire, you know. I mean, it wasn't it was you know the crowd was so small it fit in the garage, you know, and yeah. uh, um, uh, but uh, you know people sort of recognize that authenticity. This guy, whether you agree with him or don't don't agree with him you know he's telling you what he truly believes he's not shading it he's not hiding from you he's willing to you know willing to tell you what he believes and take take his lungs and uh uh you know i think uh, that's a, an admirable quality that most people do in fact admire yeah and, and so mark while you while you write that the that event was a, a truly inspirational moment for him to keep going i think you also said at the time that he confided in perhaps you and maybe a few others i'm not gonna win this thing you know i right well, we had a funny we had a funny so i you know i had advised him against some of the personnel changes he was you know they were gonna crop up and uh, so he and i had a difficult i i thought i had convinced him to just keep slogging along with the team we had and uh and uh but he came back determined to make some decisions which resulted in people leaving the campaign uh, uh nobody was fired but people left because of it and uh um um and, you know, I sort of had this uh, difficult conversation with him about it. And uh, he said, OK, I said, you know, look, I had advised you not to do this. Maybe I should step aside, too, you know. And uh, he said, well, first, you told me you wouldn't leave the campaign. So I expect you to keep your word. And he said, but sit down, sit down. And he just kind of looked at me and, you know, he said, look, t- 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 you know, tomorrow I'm going to get on a plane. I'm going to go to New Hampshire. I'm going to talk about Iraq at this event. 
in New Concord, New Hampshire, the, all the national media is going to be there. And they're all going to be there to see if I literally drop dead. <laughs> and, and, like, and he goes, like crows on a wire. They're going <laughs> to, and, uh, you know, and I'm going to go out there. I'm going to, you know, fly coach. I'm going to, like, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to small crowds. I'm going to, you know, beg people for money. I'm going to, you know, and at the end of this, you know, you know, in my year from now, I'm going to get my ass kicked, you know, and he goes, now, why, <laughs> why are you such a wimp? You know? <laughs> uh, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was yeah, very persuasive that way. That's right. Yeah. I remember those days. Well, I remember hosting a fundraiser for him and, California and he pulled up in a rental car all by himself carrying his bag and just an amazing feat really a, probably one of the greatest political comebacks in in history so it was really kind, of, kind of overshadowed by by the Obama campaign but it really was a, 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 an extraordinary recovery I mean, really. yeah yeah um just a couple more questions for you Mark um what do you think Senator McCain was most proud of um in his his career, what if there were a, one single thing that um, he was asked to say, what he felt he stood out for, what, what might it be? I don't know if he, he, he could do that. I think he would say probably something like, I'm proud of the fact that as chairman and ranking member of the Armed Service Committee, every year we reported the defense authorization bill out of that committee by, if not unanimous, close to unanimous vote. And it, we got it through the floor by a large uh, margin and and it was signed by the president. <laughs> I think he, you know because yeah. because in this day and age that that that's that's a feat. And uh, uh, he would say something like that. I think there were major things he was involved in. I think the normalization of relations with Vietnam it played. A, you know he he looked back with uh, you know that I was proud that he was had been a part of that. Um, you know, McCain fine gold was a big extraordinary accomplishment. The thing with McCain was, and why it's so hard for me to answer that question is he 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 could not stay in a moment once an issue had been decided. You know, even if it was a bad, it, you know, it, it was a, his resilience was fantastic. But it was a miserable, like when he was stuck in the Keating Five. <clears throat> you know, he got you know, it, when it was over, he got out of it. You know, he just because he's always forward, always forward, but. Um, to sometimes the exasperation of staff and, and, and associates, you know, he wouldn't stay in, you know, oh, we, we, some bill we'd worked on for two years or five years or six years would pass. He goes, yeah, fine. It's done next. You know, and so he never, he never, he never, he wasn't that kind of guy to sort of look back on things and say, oh boy, remember the time we got that amendment. You know, it was just not, you know, it just wasn't, uh, I, um, I think he was proud of his, uh, advocacy of the surge. I think the things he was, where he felt his judgment was affirmed, you know, but uh, um, I don't think he, if you asked him to like, what was the, what was the key, key, you know, the key highlight of your Senate career? I, I don't think he can answer it. Well, how would it's historians, whatever I, whatever I do tomorrow, you know? It's, yeah, sure, sure. But then how would historians, you know, 50 years from now, how would they define um, his most glorious achievement? I mean, I think he helped to make the institution function the way it was you know, meant to function, modestly, but it functioned. You know, our system isn't set up for one side to carry its agenda sweeping through. It's just there are three branches of government and there are two houses of Congress and they're often in opposing parties' hands. And uh, it's, it's set up to be slow going. And the Senate through relationships, uh, really, um, and, and through its own bizarre customs, you know, the filibuster, which everybody seems to want to get away from now, but it really was an inducement to compromise, um, you know, um, those sort of things he used to f forge partnerships with other members of that body from Ted Kennedy and Joe Biden and John Kerry and uh, others, you know, and a lot of Republicans on his side to, to uh, you know, to usually through the committee process where you, you get to know the members of the committees you're on better than you know the rest of the members. You might have a meal. McCain was an inveterate traveler, obviously. He was, his, he, the issues he, he, he spent most of his time on were foreign and defense issues. Um, and he would take, you know, he would love to put together uh, interesting congressional delegations to travel with him where he would take seemingly polar opposites. I remember one of his last codels 
had Elizabeth Warren and Dave Perdue he invited on it, you know, which who might represent, you know, both both ends of the spectrum, you know, and uh, and so because you know you're traveling, you know, uh, you know, long days in many countries, and you know you're eating your meals together, and you know sometimes friendships bloom in those things, and that can be helpful, you know. It's making yeah. that, I think, it, I think what historians should say about him is he helped make the place work as it was three yards in a cloud of dust. But as he said mm -hmm. in his speech, and I think the, a speech he was proud of when he came back from his diagnosis and gave what he called the regular order speech on there, he said, you know, that's a marvelous achievement in, in a system like ours. You know, we make modest progress in the problems of our time. That's what we're here to do. Yeah. Um, so final question, uh, actually not a question, really more of a request, Mark, would be if you could um, turn to the epilogue um, in your book. And I just think it'd be great for those watching to hear in the author's own voice um, words that uh, I have no doubt are extremely important to you, but for gosh sakes were important to John McCain, if, if you would. And just maybe a little context for what you're about to read, and then let's hear it. What I'm reading about here is he, uh, um, well, he, had, yeah, okay. Um, we're right at the end. Uh, he started to suffer uh, near the end from aphasia where he had trouble finding words. Um, but we had, one, he had three, when he was diagnosed and he was very realistic about his prognosis, he never kidded himself for a minute. Um, he, he had three things he wanted to get done. And uh, he wanted to get his papers, archive set up, and, and he wanted to plan his funerals and who would speak at him um, because he wanted them to carry a political message, and uh, which was that our differences are minor, you know, compared to all the things we have in common, you know, a common set of values and a common set of responsibilities to the country. He wanted to emphasize his funeral to emphasize that. And he wanted that we were in the middle of writing a book, which was going to be more about, and it, there's quite a bit of it in there, but it was mostly foreign policy focused and uh, to, to become sort of a farewell. And uh, this is how th that book ends. And he was very proud of how it ended. Um, and so uh, so he's he's ill and uh, uh, we're probably a, a few weeks, maybe a month from the end of his life. Uh, near the end, while he still could, John would read aloud to, cl to close friends and family the closing lines of our last book, tapping his finger on the page as he read, quote, what an ingrate I would be to curse the fate that concludes the blessed life I've led. I hope those who mourn my passing, and even those who don't, will celebrate as I celebrate a happy life lived in imperfect service to a country made of ideals whose continued success is the hope of the world. And I wish all of you great adventures, good company, and lives as lucky as mine, close quote. He reached a point where speaking more than a few words became difficult. In one of our last visits, he pointed at the passage and gestured for me to read it. I did as he wished, and fighting tears, I managed to say, thank you, John. Thank you for everything. That's the end of the book. Yeah, quite a close. Um, and fitting. Um, I, I can't tell you how lucky we are to have spent this time with you, Mark, on such a, talking about such a terrific book. And I wish you and all those that surround it Senator McCain uh, in his life, just nothing but luck and good fortune. And uh, thank you again for, 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 for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me on. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, John. Take care, Mark. You too. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do.